Hello and welcome to the video. In this video we're going to start to answer the questions that were on the very first Crossfire video that I released a couple of weeks ago. Now in that video I talked about what Crossfire is, how to set it up, we went through what CRSF is and some other pieces and as part of that I asked you as subscribers and viewers to let me know if there's anything else in particular that you wanted me to cover in any more depth and there were some fantastic responses to that so I've collected those comments and questions together and put them in this list here. So in this video, what I'm going to do is probably only get about halfway through these and then I'll link to the next video where we'll complete this list because in the test that I've just done, uh, it took about 40-45 minutes of talking to get through all of these answers and I don't want to do that in one big video. I'm not sure my voice can cope with it and I'm sure you wouldn't be able to either. But the other thing I'll do as well is I'll put all the time codes in the description below. So if you're only interested in one particular answer, you can just jump to that and hopefully I'll shed a little bit more light on it. Big thank you to the people at Team Black Sheep who have been very generous with their time and helped to provide an awful lot of context and background for these answers. I will be covering some of this at a reasonably high level. Apologies in advance for any of you that really understand a lot about radio systems because I'm going to use a couple of analogies that might put your teeth on edge. But the idea with this is to help those of you that haven't done your amateur radio certifications or researched radio technology to understand exactly what this stuff is all about. So I'm going to be using the larger Crossfire. Uh, the smaller version doesn't have this little screen and joystick at the back, but this is super to kind of show you what's going on. Now, the Crossfire itself normally plugs into the back of the radio, as we saw in the last video. Uh, but the reason I'm zoomed in so tight is I want to show you the screen for the first bit. Now, you can power the Crossfire from the USB cable. If I plug that in, there she's firing up. I'm running the beta version of the firmware, the very latest and greatest, and that gives me all these additional graphs that lots of people have asked about. So the first one we're going to go to, if I just click the joystick to the right, is the signal to noise ratio downlink. Now that is a relative number you use while you're flying, not really useful when you're sat on the ground. There's a zero position, which is that little dotted line in the middle. Then we have minus 10 and 40. And it's an indicator of how much background noise there is for the signal that you're trying to hear. So imagine you're at a very loud party, there's music playing, there's lots of people talking loudly, and you're desperately trying to hear the person next to you in that room. All that background noise and the music is the noise, and the person that's trying to talk to you is the signal. And obviously, the louder the noise and the quieter the signal, the more trouble you're going to have hearing it. And that's what this is showing you. So when you are flying, you are okay to fly until you get to that zero position, that dotted line. At that point, you've got about 50% of your range left. And then once you're below that zero position, then you're starting to get into trouble. And at minus eight dB, because it's actually a decibel scale this, you have no more link at all. So ideally, you want to be making sure that you don't go below zero. Although if you went minus three, minus four, you'd probably get away with it. But once you get to minus eight, then you've lost your link and you're in fail safe. Noise downlink. At the moment, I don't have a receiver connected. haven't got my little green light on. It'll show you how noisy the current environment is. You can see it's kind of picking up little bits of radio noise from where I am here. At the moment, it's showing about 114 dBm. Minus 100 dBm is fine. Minus 90 potentially will cause you problems. So if you see this number getting towards about minus 90, then you need to have a look at what's causing that around you. Next one is error rate. Uh, at the moment, we got a 100% error rate for everything, but then I haven't got a receiver connected. And by default, you'll have about three to 5% uh, error rates as you're flying and that is absolutely normal. If you have significantly more than that, that's an indicator that there's something going on and you probably need to check it. You can set alerts for all of those pieces in OpenTX in the menu. If you want me to show how that works, leave a comment in the description, but it's exactly the same as all the other OpenTX bits and pieces. You discover your sensors, you find the sensor that you're interested in, and then you can use the logical switches to turn things on and off and have tracks played. 
Next thing that uh, there's a lot of confusion about is RSSI and LQ. Now with RSSI, it's a little bit of an interesting one. It's the one that we use the most in the hobby and it's actually, again, a logarithmic scale in decibels. So unfortunately, the way decibels work is completely confusing for anyone that hasn't worked in any kind of scientific discipline, where LQ is just a straightforward percentage. Now, the recommendation from TBS at the moment is that you use LQ as the indicator for how healthy the radio signal is and how much you've got left. So you can configure one of the channels on your TBS receiver to show the LQ status, and then in Betaflight, you just pick that channel just like you would any other RSSI setup. Now, the way LQ works is a little bit different. So 100% LQ is obviously full signal strength, but you don't want to go below about 60% LQ. So as you're flying around and you're getting down to about 70, 65, that's the point you need to turn around and come back home. 60% uh, is the lowest that you want to chance. If you go below that, then you are tempting fate. I believe there are some developments going on around that at the moment, so that might change in future. So again, always double check the latest and greatest information from Team Black Sheep. But at the moment, if you're going to use anything to indicate your signal strength for Crossfire in an on-screen display or something like that, then LQ is the one you want to use and turn for home when you get down to 70%. Next one to talk about then is antenna alignment for maximum signal strength. Now, antenna alignment, there's nothing particularly exotic about this. It's exactly the same as any antenna alignment for these kind of dipole linear antennas. Now, the way this works is that the strongest signal for the antenna is going to be received from the transmitter when the antennas are exactly aligned. So let me just put these two vertically like that just for the demo, bear with me. Uh, so at the moment, these two antennas on the transmitter module and on the radio receiver are perfectly aligned and that will give me the best possible radio reception and the best possible range. The danger is, of course, is that we don't tend to fly our multi-rotors and our planes perfectly level all the time. They're banking and rolling, and occasionally with things like multi-copters, we'll be flipping upside down and doing all kind of wacky stuff too. Now what happens is, if you have your two antennas aligned, like that, uh, we have great signal strength. As it starts to move out of alignment, up to about 45 degrees, you've lost about 30% of your signal. Over 45 degrees to 90, you lose the rest. And when they're like that, completely unaligned, you have the worst signal at all. Well, not quite the worst, because actually the worst signal is when the antennas are aligned like this, because there is a dead spot uh, that comes out the top and a dead spot that comes out the bottom of the antenna. So if you were flying along and your antenna is directly pointing at your radio receiver, then you have a horrible situation. If they are completely unaligned, so rather than being aligned together, they're at 90 degrees, that's horrific as well but the best signal is when they're perfectly aligned. So ideally you want to be mounting your antennas on the craft in a way that's going to give you good reception even as you roll and yaw the craft around. Now the Crossfire uses a lot of digital reconditioning, so it's got a way of dealing with cross orientation. So it's not as bad as um, a complete analog systems that we're used to, but there are a couple of tricks you can use to give you a hand. Now on the standard Crossfire diversity receiver, let me just plug this antenna back in, the recommendation is, is that what you do is you mount the antennas at a 90 degree angle, like that. And the reason is, is that you always have about 70% of the signal hopefully there. So well, as it's flying around, it's completely level. It's um, They're both kind of 45 degrees to the antenna. As you roll and bank, then actually what will happen is one of the antennas is actually coming into alignment with the other side and giving you the best possible signal. So that's the best way to do it. If you're gonna use one of the really small receivers that have this kind of antenna, again, the same thing happens. If the antennas are perfectly aligned, then you get the best signal. However, this is almost certainly gonna be installed on a multi-rotor. Your best bet 
is actually to mount the antennas in an L or V shape and do exactly the same thing on the craft. So as it rolls around, one of them is going to go into phase. Now, the price you pay, of course, is by doing this with your receivers, you lose a little bit of maximum range, but it gives you better signal quality while you're flying around, and hopefully you're not going to get into a situation where you're going to trigger a failsafe. The next question is how to unlock a locked module. Now we talked about in the last video that in the latest versions of the firmware it comes and powers up and says okay which territory you're in, you set your territory and it locks that territory. Now at the moment in the firmware there is a little way that if you've done that and you've selected the wrong one or you want to go back and change your mind there is a way out of it. Now on these larger modules uh, if you google for TBS Konami code TBS tend to put the Konami code in an awful lot of their products and I think it's up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, enter, enter. If you do that while it's bound to a radio receiver, it'll unlock the module and it'll ask you the question again. Now on the smaller Crossfire radio module that doesn't have the screen and the joystick that allows you to put the Konami code in directly, then this is a button and what you do is you press that 10 times, again, while it's bound to a receiver, press it 10 times quite quickly, and that will unlock it as well. So you're not completely snookered if you accidentally chose the wrong territory and found you're limited to 25 milliwatts. Next question we've got is around frequency hopping. Is it supported? Does it support multiple pilots? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, theoretically, it goes up to about eight pilots with no significant loss of link quality. However, the recommendation is if you're going to fly lots of pilots together, then you should turn your telemetry off to give the maximum bandwidth available so that you can all get a good strong signal. With a future firmware update, you may be able to fly with telemetry with multiple pilots, but that isn't here yet. So you can absolutely fly. If you've got two or three mates and you want to fly together, that should be fine. But if you're going to have up to eight, then TBS suggests turning off telemetry to give you the best possible experience flying together. The next question then is around using non-CRSF kit. Now we talked in the last video about the fact that the way that this module talks to the radio and then the way the radio receiver talks to the flight controller is using CRSF. And CRSF is that protocol that Team Black Sheep have developed. It's very fast, very low latency, and bi-directional as well, and some really cool stuff that we're gonna be able to do with it. The challenge is, is that not all systems at the moment support CRSF, but it looks like lots of people are developing the support for it at the moment. So in those cases, how do you get it all to work? Now the nice thing, if we go back into our box of bits, and we pull out the cables that we've got with the Crossfire, then you'll notice here that there are additional cables. Now at the moment, the way that mine's set up is obviously I'm plugging it into a JR bay, but if you have something like a Spectrum radio that doesn't have a JR bay, then what you're gonna to have to do is use the same RC input, and you're gonna to have to disconnect that and use one of these cables instead. And you're gonna to have to use the trainer port on the back of the radio, so that would work good old three and a half millimeter jack on something like a spectrum and then we also have a couple of other cables for the different trainer style ports on the radio that you're using. Uh, the Crossfire supports PPM. PPM is a lot slower than CRSF but it does allow you to use other radios than the ones that we've looked at already in the series with the system. But talking to TBS, they've talked about the fact that they're working with both Spectrum and Fataba on the support for the CRSF protocol. So that could mean that in the very near future, you'll be able to plug this into the trainer port on the back of your Fataba radio or your Spectrum radio and get CRSF support directly into the module. Last question for this video, uh, connecting to a KISS system, does it support CRSF? Yes, it absolutely did. They've added CRSF support a while ago now, and actually so has RaceFlight. So see the documentation for both of those systems on how you set that up and how you configure it all as well. Remember, CRSF usually needs two pins, one for transmit and one for receive, so you're probably going to be connecting it onto a UART rather than the standard SBUS or PPM connections on those flight controllers as well. 
So we got about halfway. So join me for the next video where we'll finish off the questions. And But if you have any other ones in addition to the list that we've been working through in this video, then pop them down below and I'll try and include them in the next video too. Thank you for taking the time to watch that video and particularly for watching right to the very end. We try and release a video on Tuesday and Friday and sometimes we'll release one or two extra ones in a week as well. All of the videos on the channel are organised into easy to use playlists so do have a look in there because if you're interested in a subject we organise all the videos on that subject so you can find them easily all together in one place. If you like what we're doing then please like and subscribe and tell others about the channel so they can come and join as well. We're available in all of the usual social media places, particularly in places like Instagram, Twitter and we also share all of our 3D designs on Thingiverse.